Hello everyone. This is the first video that I'm posting since the hurricane. And uh, before we begin, I'd just like to take a second to tell everybody thank you for the beautiful comments and the messages, uh, the words of support that uh, you guys showed to myself and to my family. It really meant a lot to us and it helped us get through uh, what was a challenging time for us. So we really appreciate it from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for that. As far as this video is concerned, you'll see on this table that I have three wooden crates. And very shortly, you're gonna see what's inside. Uh, the way that I acquired uh, what's in these crates is uh, through the act of generosity from a uh, gentleman who lives up in Canada. I won't put his name out there, but uh, he'll be watching this video and he knows who he is. Anyways, uh, he and I had been in some discussions about purchasing uh, this electric motor uh, that's in this crate and uh, this particular motor is extremely rare and it's extremely sought after and uh, when I saw that uh, I had the opportunity to get my hands on it I was uh, pretty excited about it so anyways we had been in communications and uh, then the hurricane happened and my wife and I lost our place and uh, suddenly my priorities changed and uh, the direction where I had to uh, allocate my financial resources also changed because uh, I didn't have a lot of disposable income because we had to buy operating furniture and buy a new house and we just had a lot of money going out and it just wasn't prudent to be spending a lot of money on uh, something that's uh, relatively frivolous. So anyways, uh, this gentleman wrote back to me and uh, he knows that I have this YouTube channel and I restore a lot of electric motors on it. and. He told me that he was going to give me the motor free of charge and all I had to do was have it shipped down to me and not only was he going to give it to me but he was going to include a second motor also free of charge and that he was willing to hold on to the motors until I was ready to accept them and uh, quite frankly I was blown away by the fact that somebody who I had never met before um, would do something so generous I mean, I, I really was floored by the, by the whole situation, to be honest with you. I don't know how else to describe it, but I was, I was shocked um, that he would offer me these motors for free. And uh, he did know that, you know, what had happened with my wife and I. He also knows that uh, I'm very passionate about these motors and I, I do try to do a, a good job on them, you know, when I restore them. And I think he appreciated that. So anyways, I'm not going to throw his name out there, but uh, you know who you are. And uh, once again, thank you for your generous gift. Um, these motors were shipped down to me from Canada. And uh, what we did was we actually took the one motor apart and uh, broke it down so that it could be shipped in a couple crates. And then uh, the second motor arrived in its own crate. So I'm going to take a minute. I'm going to open up these boxes and we'll take a look at what's inside. This is the second motor that he included in the crates. This motor is not the subject of this video. Uh, it might be a later video, but I just wanted to show you what he gave me. This motor is pretty rare in its own right. It was manufactured by the Globe Electric Company out of Chicago, uh, probably in the 20s. Has a beautiful snowflake design on the end bells. Um, the motor does have some damage. Uh, you can see right here some of the casting is cracked so that's going to require some repair anyways i'm just going to uh, show this quickly um, this is a one horsepower motor by the way um, and we'll deal with this one later now let's get to the main motor which is going to be the subject of this video so here we have in front of us an extremely rare motor made by the emerson electric company uh, this particular motor is a one horsepower and uh, what's unique about this motor, this motor was made in around 1900. And what's interesting about it is that it has a manual starting system. So this motor is, it's like a repulsion start induction run, um, but it does have some differences as opposed to like a century or something like that. Uh, the primary difference is electrical in that the brushes on this motor are ran in series um, so they conduct current to the armature as opposed to the century type motors which bring current to the armature through induction 
Um, the brushes on a Century motor, for example, they are not hardwired into the circuit, whereas on this one, they are. Um, anyways, the motor starts off with the brushes on the commutator, and once it gets up to speed, you manually move the brushes off the commutator, and that same action moves the shorting ring onto the commutator, and then it runs as an induction motor. So um, this is really a beautiful motor, and it's going to be a, a challenging project to get it running um, because we really want to take our time on it. And we do not want to do a restoration, but we want to do a conservation, um, as I've described in the past, an invisible restoration. So I'm going to bring the camera in and we'll take a closer look at this beautiful piece. So before we go any further, it's important to note that the gentleman who gave me this motor told me that he was not able to get the motor running. He said that he did apply power to it. As a matter of fact, he machined those carbon brushes uh, to fit the motor. And he told me that when he applied power to it, it just made some noise. It like hummed or growled and um, it did not run. So uh, we'll just make a note of that as we begin. Anyways, Starting over here at the armature, uh, one thing I can see right off the bat is that those brushes were arcing pretty badly on this commutator because you can see there's some damage there from, uh, from arcing of the brushes. Another thing that we can notice is that there's some insulation missing in a number of spots here on these windings. The shafts look like they're in pretty good condition. Uh, now I have not done any electrical tests on this armature yet. I haven't put on a growler, nothing like that. We're just doing a visual observation of this thing at this time. Uh, here I have the shorting necklace. This is really a substantial and heavy shorting necklace. That's pretty amazing. Anyways, the shorting necklace resides here on this insulation strip when it's not being used. And then when that lever is pushed forward, the shorting necklace moves onto the commutator segments like that, shorts them out to put it in induction mode. So uh, once we get into the project a little bit further, we'll do some electrical tests on this armature and uh, see what kind of condition it's in. As we move on to the motor itself, the quality of construction on this machine is absolutely unbelievable. I mean, the, the brass fittings and the way that they machined everything and the overall stoutness of the build. I mean, it was really made to last a lifetime and it's, it's really like a work of art, um, a functional work of art. So as we move in here, let's start over here at these wires. So the first thing that I can see just on visual observation is that the insulation is missing here. This wire is shorting out against the housing. So that's problem number one. Could be why it wasn't running. Just, just that alone right there would definitely cause a problem. So um, there's a switch here. If you look at the switch, this is a fairly complex switch. So the motor right now is in the off position and then when it goes to the start position, the switch moves like that, okay? And in this position, it's running on the brushes. Then, to switch it into induction mode, once it gets up to speed, you advance this again, and the switch moves over here. Now, looking at this switch, we can see this contact bar right here, that's completely worn out. See how that's all black like that? That's arced. So um, this thing had a lot of sparking going on and these contacts on this switch part right here, those are completely worn away. So um, that's definitely something that would cause an issue with it running. Um, so these contacts are gonna have to be refabricated. This part is gonna have to be refabricated. Um, so it'll be interesting to take this thing apart and see the wiring and uh, fabricate those pieces just to uh, get it going again. So. That's definitely impacting the performance of it. Moving up here, we can see there's actually four oil sight glasses on this motor. And it has two rings for ring oilers. It, it, it's a dual configuration. I mean, it's really amazing. Um, the other side here, you can see there's the oil sight glass here. And look at this valve. It's like a, a petcock valve. I mean, it's, it's so detailed and well made. It's really, it's really something. This looks like the original set of bearings in there. And uh, up here, this knob controls the position of the brushes. So with, with this action, you can make the motor run clockwise or counterclockwise by changing the relative uh, position of the brushes. Here's your brush holders. 
there's only two brushes on this motor and uh, there's actually a spring over here and that keeps the pressure on the brushes and here on top on the terminal block this appears to be made out of some kind of a slate it might be that electrical slate something like that one thing that we can see is we're missing one of these lugs so I'm gonna have to try to make one because I'm not gonna be able to go down to Ace Hardware and buy one and we're also missing one of these thumb screws and it's the same with that I'm gonna have to try to manufacture one of those because um, it would be impossible to find a, a, an identical replacement to that. So we are gonna have to do some machining of a couple new parts. Uh, the other thing I noticed is back over here, this bolt right here is broken off the head of it. If you look here, the head of that one is snapped off. So we're gonna have to get that out of there because we won't be able to take these wires out until we get that bolt removed. And uh, that's gonna be a delicate operation getting that out. Uh, there was a couple other there's a screw that's missing over here on this uh, sight glass here. Now, of course, I haven't taken it apart yet to look uh, what's going on, you know, internally with the bearing assembly. But once we get in there, we'll have a better idea. Uh, looking at the windings, we can see that we are missing insulation in several areas. And so that's going to have to be uh, fixed for it to be running optimally. Now, I haven't checked this with a uh, Mega yet, but just on pond visual inspection, I mean, for the age of it, it, it looks pretty good. I mean, I don't see any any catastrophic flaws, you know, anything that looks fatal. Um, so it's just, it looks to me like it just needs some TLC and it's just going to be a delicate operation to uh, bring it back to life. And uh, we're going to go ahead and take a bunch of pictures right now. I'm going to photograph every square inch of this thing uh, because once you get all these pieces <laughs> taken apart, you know, and you come back to it sometime later, it could be really confusing. As you can see, this is a pretty complex design. So uh, we definitely want to have a lot of pictures uh, to use as reference photos when we're putting it back together. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now off camera and uh, we're going to start taking this thing apart. Two other quick things before we get started is I forgot to mention that it is missing its nameplate. Uh, I'm going to call upon my friend Tom Utley over at Vaughn Industrial to fabricate us a new one. Uh, he really does outstanding work. And if you recall, he made the plate for the FS Betts motor, which uh, we restored some time ago. Also, somebody has ground several different divots uh, in this piece here. Now, there's, there's supposed to be one in there. The purpose of that is to engage the lever so that it stays in position uh, while it's in start mode and then you advance it to the run mode from there It looks like they were having a difficult time finding a sweet spot to get it to run uh, Probably because of all the arcing and sparking that was happening Anyways, so they tried to uh, grind a few different positions in there and uh, As a result, this is, is kind of damaged. So we'll see if we can uh, fill that in a little bit and make it function a little bit better because those are so deep that that that, that catch is too much on that and it requires too much force to move that forward. So we'll look at it a little bit closer when the time comes. Here's the bearing housing assembly broken down as far as it can be uh, with the exception of I did not press that sleeve bearing out of there just because I'm going to reuse it. It's in perfect condition. So there's no reason to press that out of there. Everything else has been uh, broken down. And um, what I thought was a missing screw was actually a broken off screw. Um, but I was able to get that out of there without too much difficulty. And there's a couple gaskets here for the uh, oil sight glasses that are going to need to be uh, remade. So anyways, we'll continue taking apart the rest of the motor. Here's the terminal block assembly broken down as far as we're going to take it. As I mentioned before, I'm missing uh, one of these lugs, one of these thumb screws, and one of these bolts. So we'll ro worry about that a little bit later. Now this part right here, there's no reason to take these blocks off of here. Uh, reason being is these are sealed in here with some like a tar type material. And in order to take them off, I'd have to drill that out, but there's no benefit in doing that. Um, same thing with these feet right here. There's no reason to take those off. Uh, as long as these are clean, they'll, they'll be okay. So uh, I don't want to drill this out and compromise that because that's all original. So uh, we're going to move on to the next part. So I'm getting ready to take apart this uh, brush holder assembly. And one thing I wanted to point out is 
there's two springs right here that press the brushes down. This spring right here has about three times the amount of pressure pressing down on the brush as this one. One of these seems like it's a replacement, but I don't know which one. Anyways, it's real important that the spring pressure on those brushes be equalized. Otherwise, the current is going to favor one brush over the other one, and that could definitely cause a problem with the uh, arcing. So that, in and of itself, could have been one reason why that commutator had that arcing on there. So when we put this back together, I'll either make a new spring or get these adjusted so that the pressure on them is the same. Anyways, let me get this thing broken down. Here we have the left and right brush holder assemblies completely broken down. Uh, one of the screws was broken off here. Uh, I got that out without too much difficulty and we're missing one screw here for this little flat spring. Uh, the only thing that I did not take off uh, in this assembly is these little insulation bushings right there. They're real brittle and they're in there real tight. Um, I could get them out but I'd have to break them to get them out and there's no there's no reason to take those out. They're fine where they're at. I'll just clean around them. So I just left those in there uh, to avoid damage. Um, so we're gonna move on to the next piece. Here's the yoke assembly broken down. Uh, these brass sleeves, this handle, and this rod right here, those are all press fit uh, real tightly into their housing. So I'm gonna leave all those. This is a pretty delicate casting here, and there's really no reason to take any of those pieces out. I could just clean around them. Uh, it's not worth the risk of damage uh, in order to remove them, so we'll leave them be. Uh, this piece right here, this is what I was talking about earlier. If you look here, see those grooves, how bad they are? So uh, that's definitely causing a problem with this piece right here. When it engages in there, it's sticking. So we'll take a look at that uh, as we proceed and see if we can get that fixed up a little bit. Anyways, we'll go on to the next part. Here's the switch assembly completely broken down. And uh, this one right here, this this uh, connecting arm in here is pressed in there like that. And uh, I couldn't get it out without using a lot of force, so I'm just gonna leave that in there. There's no real reason why that needs to come out. So we'll leave that in there. Uh, this contact right here is the one that we talked about in the beginning. It's completely arced up, so we're gonna make a new one of those. And over here, uh, over the years, some people have replaced these contacts, and uh, unfortunately, I, I hit these with the uh, buffer just so I can see a little bit better. So if you look at uh, this one here, you can see that somebody put a pin in there to hold those contacts in. Unfortunately, the pin is only driven in from one side. So in order to get those out, that's gonna be a little bit of a challenge to try to remove those. This one here, you could see where somebody modified that. But this one, the pins go all the way through, so that's a little bit easier. Uh, this one is in pretty good shape because this one doesn't really serve any electrical purpose. And this one here, there's a pin right there. And just like the other one, that pin only goes through halfway. So uh, it'll be a delicate operation getting those contacts out of there, but we'll get them out of there because these are going to have to be cleaned up and, and uh, on this one at least are going to have to be changed. So anyways, we're going to move on to the uh, last bearing housing assembly. Here's the other bearing housing assembly completely broken down. And once again, we're going to leave the inner sleeve bearing, just, just leave it in there because I'm going to reuse that. It's in fantastic condition. And how could it not be when you have two rings picking up oil and uh, keeping it lubricated in a nice oil bath? What fantastic engineering this, this motor has. Anyways, we're gonna carry on. So I just wanna measure the stator windings before I remove the stator from the base. So let's see how we do. Almost infinity, which is pretty spectacular for a motor that's 123 years old. Now I'm in the process of cleaning up the base and uh, what I'm doing is I'm just removing all the old grease, uh, cleaning it up as good as I can. I'm just using WD-40 uh, mostly to clean it with and a little bit of uh, degreaser. I don't want to use any harsh chemicals on there because there is a little bit of gold pinstriping on there. So I don't want to remove that. And then uh, once I get this thing cleaned up, I'm going to uh, polish it with some Boston polish and just give it a nice sheen to it. I'm not gonna clear coat it or repaint it or anything like that. 
So I want to work on the base first so that as I restore the other pieces, I can just put them on the base uh, in order. Now that we got the base cleaned up, I'm gonna go ahead and get started on the stator. So in order to clean this, I'm gonna use my usual method of just a soft brush and some uh, electronic cleaner. Gonna get in there, take our time, get everything nice and clean. Uh, the areas where the insulation is missing, and some areas it's missing completely, I'm gonna use a two-part epoxy in those areas and just touch up the areas where there's no insulation at all. And then, um, We'll give the whole thing a coating of the uh, spray-on EL600 uh, insulating varnish uh, when we're ready to do that. Also, we have to do some rewiring here. Uh, over here at this juncture, this, this wire here that goes to the brush, that thing was completely destroyed. Fortunately, every time I go to a uh, antique tractor show or a flea market, if I ever come across any antique wires, uh, like a spool of it, I always buy it. So I have quite a collection of antique wiring. And fortunately, I have this wire right here. This is not a reproduction, you know, this is, the, this is actual old school wire. And uh, you can see it's a cloth covered wire. This is an eight gauge wire, which is pretty heavy. And uh, the wire that was on there was a pretty heavy wire. So eight, eight gauge is more than enough for that. Uh, anyways, uh, these wires were, uh, they were damaged. I'm going to rewire it using that uh, vintage wiring so it'll maintain the same appearance that it had before but uh, it'll be a little bit safer electronically. So anyways I'm going to go ahead and get started on cleaning this thing up. I'm making some good progress on these stator windings. I'm using two-part epoxy, and I've gone ahead and I've put it wherever the insulation was compromised. In some areas, it was missing completely. So while that's drying, I'm focusing my attention on this junction here where these two wires come out. Uh, if you'll recall, in the beginning of the video, the gentleman told me that this motor does not run. And I could see where somebody tried to make a repair. I removed that vinyl electrical tape. And when I removed it, the first thing that caught my attention was this wire right here, which goes to the right carbon brush, if you're looking at the motor from the front. It's only held on with about three strands. The rest of them are broken off. So that in and of itself could have been a reason why the motor wasn't running, just that alone. Uh, so this wire, I'm going to go ahead and solder on a new lead using my new old stock uh, cloth covered wire. This wire over here, which is a solid core wire, this wire seems to be okay, all the uh, insulation is on there. So I'm just gonna clean that and I'll put a coat of insulation varnish on there and we'll preserve that one. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that soldered up right now. I ended up switching to this wire instead of the other one. Uh, unfortunately, the other wire I had was a little bit brittle. That's the uh, chance you take when you buy wire that's that old. Anyways, this wire is uh, still a heavy gauge and it's in perfect condition, so it's real nice and flexible. Anyways, it looks great, so we're gonna carry on. Now I'm working on the terminal block and I've applied a couple coats of the Boston polish on there just to give that a nice little sheen but it's not going to get anything more than that. Now as far as these brass pieces are concerned and this other hardware here, the only areas that I'm shining up to a polish are the areas that need to make electrical contact. Obviously the areas that need to make uh, 
a contact, those areas need to be clean. But the rest of them, we want to preserve it and keep it looking uh, original. So what I'm using for this project is this wheel called a carding wheel. And I've showed this in previous videos. This wheel, it's used a lot in gunsmithing and it's very soft. So you put your finger on there and it doesn't tear your finger up. It's almost like a piece of steel wool. So the nice thing about that wheel is what it does is it cleans the piece but it does not put a bright polish on there and it doesn't scratch it. For example, if you used a wire wheel and you and you tried to clean these, they'd get all scratched up and they'd get polished up too much. So I wanna clean the corrosion off of them. Uh, for example, this piece right here, it's corroded and corrosion is not patina, it's just a sign of neglect. So any areas that are corroded, for example, on some of the hardware here, I'm gonna clean that off of there and then um, I'll use this wheel here just to give them a nice little sheen. We want them to look old, but we want them to look clean. And if I get them a little too shiny in any area, I'll come back in with the chemical darkener and I'll just touch that up a little bit so it blends back in. And I also have a wire wheel, a uh, wire brush and the drill press just so I can hit the insides of these because the insides of these do need to make an electrical contact. Uh, at this time, I'm not making the new pieces. I'm just working on cleaning up the existing pieces. So that's what we're doing right now. I screwed the stator back onto the base and reattached the terminal block up on top. That way, as I restore the other subsections, I could just kind of put them in place as we go. So, so far, it's looking pretty good. Now I'm working on the bearing housing assemblies. Uh, this is the rear one here. So one of the first things I got to do is clean up these surfaces here where the gaskets go because uh, these are a little bit corroded and uh, we won't get a good mating surface if those are not clean. So I'm cleaning these up. Uh, I'm degreasing everything. I'm just using mostly WD-40 for this. I don't want to take off any of the existing paint so I can't dip it in like the purple power or anything like that because that'll remove the paint in the process. So I'm using a combination of WD-40 uh, hand cleaner and dish soap just to clean in there and clean out all the old oil as best as possible. Then we're going to uh, clean up these parts. I do have one missing uh, screw there. I'll have to find a replacement for that. And uh, so we're going to do the same thing here. Just give these a light cleaning, but we don't want them to be too shiny. So I'm going to go ahead and work on that and get this thing back together. Uh, I'm also going to hit this with the coat of the Boston polish like I did on the other pieces. Uh, get this clean and maybe two coats of the wax and that's all that's going to get. Both bearing housing assemblies are now reassembled and ready to go. Now I'm working on cleaning up the two brush holder assemblies and I'm doing it the same way I did the other ones. I've already replaced, if you'll recall, there was a uh, broken off bolt in one of these holders. I've already replaced that and I weathered it uh, so it matches the other hardware and one of these little flat springs was missing a screw. I've already replaced and weathered that. Um, so once I get these cleaned up, the only thing that'll be left to do once we get them installed is, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, one of these springs has a stronger tension than the other. So uh, when we put it back together, we wanna make sure that both of those springs are putting an equal amount of pressure on the two brushes. So we'll make some adjustments on that uh, as we put it back together.
So I've got the yoke assembly uh, mostly put back together and now I'm fine tuning it because one thing that I noticed was when this yoke comes forward it's hitting this brush holder and lifting it slightly before it hits that one even though when I put it back together I had those evenly spaced it's just the way that that yoke is machined it's not a precision uh, casting and consequently this side hits a little bit before that so I'm fine-tuning the position of these brush holders so that those hit at the same time. And the other thing I did is on these uh, two insulating rings right here, I had to repair them with a little bit of two-part epoxy because they had a little split in there. So I used some uh, epoxy and got those fixed up. So I'm just gonna get these uh, adjusted so that the yoke is hitting them at the same time and uh, this piece will be ready to go. I spent a few minutes reshaping these uh, springs that keep the tension on the carbon brushes. This one, for whatever reason, was shaped differently than the other one, and it was putting down a lot more pressure on this brush than that one. So now I got them balanced out, and uh, they have an equal amount of pressure uh, pushing down on them. Plus, I also got those uh, brush holders lined up good, so now the yoke is hitting both of the brush holders and releasing them at exactly the same time. So the motor was missing one of the terminal lugs and one of the terminal thumb screws. So I'm working on machining uh, one of each of those right now, uh, mimicking the old ones that are on there. And then uh, once I'm done, I'll weather them and uh, hopefully they'll blend in with what's on there. Here's our new tag, which just came in from Tom Utley over at Vaughn Industrial. Uh, Tom also made us the tag on the FS Betts motor that we did a while back. Anyways, he really does a good job of recreating these tags uh, whenever you're working on a piece that's missing one. I chose to make this tag out of 3 16 of an inch thick solid copper. Uh, of course, you could always use brass. Anyways, I think that this is going to age and patina nicely uh, like copper does. So uh, let's get this put on the motor and see how it looks. All right, so we have our tag on there and it really looks beautiful. Uh, I did weather it a little bit, just using some chemicals. And uh, if it gets a little, to be a little bit too much with the weathering, I could always knock it back with a little bit of steel wool, but it looks great the way it is. So uh, we're just gonna leave it be. Okay, so one thing we haven't discussed in this video is I did not show any work on the rotor for this motor. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, the gentleman who I got the motor from told me that the motor does not work. So I knew that going in that the motor didn't didn't run. And um, I didn't know what kind of problems it had. All I knew is, as I mentioned before, he told me that it hummed and that, you know, it it's I don't know if it sparked or what it did. But it, anyways, nothing was happening. So while I had this thing apart, um, I was checking out the rotor. And I determined that the rotor does have an internal fault. It does have a little short inside of it. And it, it was throwing a little bit of a spark uh, around the commutator when it was running. And uh, if you look on the top shelf behind me there, you'll see uh, that little device. It's called a growler. And I showed this a in a couple of my other videos. And that's a useful device for um, finding short circuits in rotors and things like that. You can't use it on, in every type of rotor, but... A good majority of them you can so anyway so I was fooling around with the rotor and I seen that this thing was throwing a little bit of a spark around the commutator which is not good um, and I mean I spent hours and hours on this rotor you know cleaning out the segments in between the commutator but make sure there's nothing in there and that was not the problem the the short is deep inside the rotor uh, so the rotor does have a small fault in it and so I used some kind of unconventional methods uh, in order to try to minimize the short. I can't undo it without rewinding it. And of course, you would never want to rewind an old motor like this because you would just ruin it. You know, I mean, it would be better off just to have it as a display piece than to rewind it with modern materials. I mean, it would just destroy everything about the motor. So I was using some thermal um, 
equipment and I was I was trying to look at, as I had the thing going I was trying to find you know where it was getting hot and um, I felt that I kind of had the area down where I where I felt the short circuit was and I was using a rubber mallet and I was trying to like tap it and seeing if I can get a little movement in there and the wires in there uh, maybe to separate them a little bit um, th these are not techniques that I would recommend that, that you do on any kind of a motor. Okay. This motor is kind of a special case because it's really just a display piece. It's not something you're going to be running all the time. All right. If it was just a regular motor, you would just have the rotor we, uh, rewound and that would be it. But in this case, I was trying to preserve it. And even though it's going to be mostly a display, it would be nice at, at least if it operated some, you know, I mean, that would really make a big difference. Um, so Anyways, I didn't record the part where I worked on the rotor, but just take my word that I put a lot of time in on it. And when I got it to, uh, to where I felt it was as good as it was going to get, you know, I got inside there with, with a long nozzle and I was able to shoot some uh, insulation varnish in there and try to coat up the wiring in there so that, um, that they weren't touching together, uh, at least not as much as they were before. So anyways, all that effort did pay off. And when I was done, I have a motor that runs. And you know, it, it's not 100% perfect, but it's 99% but it's perfect. And um, compared to how it was when I got it, let me tell you, I was doing some cartwheels um, <laughs> when, I seen that, when I seen that thing running under its own power. So anyways, I'm gonna get the camera set up here and we'll fire it up and let you check it out. So you can see it actually runs pretty quiet once it's running. Um, you can hear a small amount of the brushes rattling around in their holders there. Uh, this design is so that once it goes into run mode, the springs lift up off the brushes and they're just kind of floating around freely in there. So that might be a little bit of uh, noise. You might be able to pick that up on the video. But anyways, that's not a problem. It actually runs pretty good now. It's quiet. So the only thing uh, I haven't done yet, and it's going to be a while before I do it, but it's not really important for the purposes of this video, is I do intend to mount that motor on a uh, stand. I have some beautiful pieces of walnut here. And uh, in order for me to build the stand, I first need to restore these two machines that are sitting on this table, which I am in the process of doing. You might notice they've been taken apart. Um, so under here I have a jointer. I need to joint these pieces. And here I have a small planer and I want to plane these down a little bit, then uh, I'm going to make a nice base for it uh, with that walnut. So anyways, um, that will be happening. It just uh, is not going to be seen in the video. So we don't want to forget to mention that this beautiful motor was designed by a gentleman named Edwin Pillsbury, and he applied for the patent for this motor in around 1898. Uh, Mr. Pillsbury worked for Holzer Cabot, and then he started working for Emerson Electric, uh, that's when he did this motor, obviously. And then in around 1904, he founded Century Electric, and we all know how much I love those Century Repulsion Start induction motors. So um, shout out to Mr. Pillsbury. He was definitely uh, an important figure in the world of electric motors. And uh, he did also work for Thomas Edison for a brief period also, uh, at least that's my understanding. So anyways, I don't want to close out this video without mentioning him. All right, so we're going to wrap up this video, and I do realize that this video was not like a step-by-step -step restoration process, but, you know, to be honest, I, I worked on this thing on and off for months. I got a lot of time in on it, way over 100 hours. I mean, I, I don't even know. I lost track of how many hours I put on it, but it was a lot. And um, anyways, you know, you don't have too many opportunities to see a motor like this uh, broken down, um, so at least you got to see a little bit of that, and hopefully you enjoyed it. So I want to say thanks again to the gentleman that uh, gave me this motor, and it was certainly a fun project, and I'm looking forward to adding this motor to my motor collection, and uh, thanks again to everybody for the support uh, for my wife and my son and I during the hurricane, and uh, we look forward to getting some more videos out to you. Take care. Bye-bye.